the London Underground is the oldest transport system of its kind in the world. For many, it's an essential part of everyday life. An icon of London, millions of people make their way through its tunnels every day to reach their final destination. With over 150 years of history, it's had its fair share of tragedy and death, from construction to collisions, from devastating fire to war. Thousands of graves, plague pits and crypts were disturbed in its construction. Passengers and employees have died on its tracks and platforms. Is this why so many ghosts refuse to leave the London Underground? West Brompton Station opened on the 12th of April 1869 and is served by the District Line as well as providing overground services. It is located just south of the now demolished Earls Court Exhibition Centre and to the west of Brompton Cemetery in the Royal Borough of Kensington and Chelsea. It is a station with a troubled past. In 1880, a serious fire broke out at the station. A storeroom on the departure platform was burnt out and rooms and offices were subjected to significant heat and smoke damage. James Wedge, aged 24, needed hospital treatment for burns when a spirit lamp tipped over, setting alight the storeroom, including its roof. He had a lucky escape. The station is said to be haunted by a tall man wearing the dark clothes of a workman from the late Victorian or Edwardian period. He is said to walk with purpose along the platform, especially during the early morning or late at night when the station is quiet. Who he is, nobody is certain, but several deaths occurred at the station in and around this time period. On the 4th of October 1890, a passenger described as around 50 years old and respectably dressed was killed in a fatal accident at the station. A train bound for Putney Bridge was waiting at the station around 10pm. As it prepared to leave, a passenger sprinted down the stairs, attempted to enter the third class carriage and missed his footing, entangling his leg between the footboards and the wheels of the carriage itself. the man fell back onto the platform and was carried along the track to Waltham Green, a station now named Fulham Broadway, three quarters of a mile away. A doctor was sent for immediately, but sadly it was too late. He was later named as Mr James Croft, a broker and appraiser from Fulham Road, Waltham Green. In 1886, a plate layer named Thomas Nibbs, aged 30, and his colleague William Biggs were working on a curved section of the overground track. A train approached, and despite the warning shout from the track supervisor when the train was at a distance of 30 yards, Thomas Nibbs was struck and killed. William Biggs managed to jump out of the way. A 
At the inquest, the driver stated that he had insufficient time to open the engine whistle. Just 20 years later, another plate layer, Harry Rogers from Acton, was killed in April 1906. He was working on the district line at the approach of the tunnel at West Brompton station when he was struck and killed instantly by a train. After his death, his body was taken to Fulham Mortuary to await an inquest. Do the apparitions of Thomas Nibbs or Harry Rogers pace along the platform, perhaps full of anger, looking for their supervisor to seek an explanation for their untimely deaths? Could either be returning to a place of work that was so familiar to them? Fatal accidents are not only associated with the early days of transport, Sadly, in 1989, a diesel locomotive crashed into the back of a goods train near West Brompton Station. Firemen had to cut the men out of the wreckage, and sadly two British rail workers died, and a third was seriously injured. In 2008, a tourist from Glasgow named Anne Eames was on her way to Victoria train station early one Saturday morning. She witnessed a tall man standing on the largely empty platform opposite, wearing dark scruffy clothes, looking directly at her. He wore dark trousers and heavy boots that were covered in dried mud. She didn't think much of this and thought he may be employed as a gardener or groundsman, perhaps at the neighbouring Brompton Cemetery. She reached down into her handbag momentarily, and when she looked up, he was gone. She remains convinced that he could not have exited the platform so quickly. Could the ghost be the phantom of a man who died at the station in mysterious circumstances in October 1897? William John Bates, aged 40, was enjoying an evening out. He'd separated from his wife and was casually dating his landlady, Mrs Sarah Henrietta Rose, and that evening they had visited Earl's Court Exhibition Centre. They'd planned to catch the 11.35 train from West Brompton, and as the train pulled up into the station, the driver felt a distinct jolt. Moments later, William Bates was found dead beneath the second-class carriage. The nature of his injuries suggests that his death was instantaneous. At the inquest, Mrs Rose's evidence seemed to be somewhat unreliable and full of contradictions. She testified that whilst waiting for the train, William saw a friend on the opposite platform and left her to cross the tracks. She declared that she was inside the train before the incident, but the porter made it quite clear that this was impossible as the train was approaching at the moment of impact. She denied that she and the deceased had been drinking in the pub outside the station, but several independent witnesses said she was there and both were somewhat merry. The driver and the guard both stated that nobody was stood on the opposite platform at the time and neither saw anybody begin to step across the tracks. Did William fall or was he pushed? It transpired that the deceased was insured under the Railway Passengers Accidental Insurance Scheme to the sum of £1,000. William had made a will and had left everything to Mrs Rose. The jury returned an open verdict. What do you think?
By the end of the 19th century, Bethnal Green was one of the poorest slums in London. The area was full of old buildings, with many families, often living in single houses. Before the underground, the streets of Bethnal Green were crowded, dangerous and dirty. In September 1889, an eight-year-old boy named Mason was working as a street hawker. He was killed outside the Salmon and Ball pub, just opposite the location of the tube entrance today. Mason and two of his friends spotted a brewer's horse and cart and hopped on the back, hoping to gain a free ride. As the coach neared to the St John on Bethnal Green Church, the driver slashed his whip, frightening the boys who leapt from the cart. Mason was struck by the horse of a passing old Ford bus and ended up beneath its wheels. He died within minutes of the impact. At the inquest, his father testified that he came from a good home and that he'd been given his school fees that Monday morning. He failed to attend school, and when he didn't return that night, Mason's parents contacted the police, who delivered the devastating news. The apparition of a white or grey figure moving quickly across Cambridge Heath Road has been seen many times. It startles drivers, has caused many a driver to hit the brakes before the figure is seen fading away. Pedestrians have heard childlike laughter when crossing Cambridge Heath Road. Could this be the apparition of Mason, so tragically killed in 1889? Or could this be the apparition of one of the other many children killed on the crowded and dangerous roads of Victorian London? There are two ghost stories connected with the tube at Bethnal Green. The first is linked to terrible tragedy. The second, it seems, remains a mystery. The underground station lies between Liverpool Street and Mile End stations and is served by the Central Line. The station opened as part of the Central Line Eastern Extension. During the Second World War, the London Underground was pressured into use as an already existing network of deep level air raid shelters for civilians to occupy during bombing campaigns. It is estimated that 177,000 people used the underground shelters on the network. In 1943, Bethnal Green Station hadn't yet opened to the public, and during this point the track itself had not been installed. The East End of London was bombed heavily during World War II, as it was the location of the docks. On March the 3rd, 1943, 173 people lost their lives and a further 92 were injured in a horrific crush that happened as civilians entered the station. Two days earlier, a heavy RAF bombing raid on Berlin had been carried out and retaliation was rumoured to be forthwith. At 8.17, what sounded like a siren was heard and people rushed to the tube station.
Moments later, loud noises panicked many as they descended the wet, dimly lit steps into the narrow entrance of the shelter. At the bottom of the stairs, a woman and child slipped and fell on the third step up from the base. Others fell around her. The situation quickly escalated and around 300 people were tangled up in the panic. Some managed to get free, but 173 people, mostly women and children, were asphyxiated and crushed. Eyewitnesses and rescuers described the harrowing scene, with one describing awful screaming and people piled up like sardines. Eliza Jones, who survived the incident, described the mass of people behind her, all of a sudden forming a human mountain. News of the crush was withheld in line with wartime reporting restrictions and the full results of the official investigation were released in 1946. The incident is thought to have been Britain's largest single loss of civilian life in the Second World War and the largest loss of life on the London Underground. 27 men were killed and 146 women and children lost their lives in the crush. In the spring of 1981, an experienced station foreman named John Graham was working alone, securing the station late at night. As he completed his routine paperwork in the office, he heard the low sound of voices mumbling in the distance. He continued with his tasks and the voices grew louder and became more distinct. He recognised the sounds of children crying along with the sounds of women screaming. For around 15 minutes, the sound filled the station and eventually became overwhelming. He left the office and went to the booking hall. He was reluctant to return to the office for fear of the noise. Are these the sounds of the victims of the Bethnal Green disaster reliving their last moments in fear and panic? People familiar with the stone tape theory may speculate that the energy of such a traumatic event may be recorded into the fabric of the station itself, inside the structures, floor and stairs, and might be replayed under certain conditions. Could the sounds be attributed to external factors, the voices of people outside the station, traffic, weather, passers-by, the noises becoming distorted in the structure of the station? Stories of a ghost of a little girl dressed in white with black eye sockets first emerged in the early 1980s. She was seen twice within a month by passengers, a young girl standing in the tunnel and giggling. She was witnessed again in 2014 by two tourists from Australia who were waiting for the tube with their little boy. They described the girl as being no more than waist height, her distinct black eye sockets were truly startling and scared their son considerably. To hear more about the ghostly girl of Bethnal Green Underground Station, please stay tuned where I'll share some more details and viewers' encounters. Turnham Green Station is located in the Chiswick district of West London. Opened in January 1869, the station is served by the district and Piccadilly lines. Whilst records show that Turnham Green doesn't share such a dark past as other stations, it apparently has a resident ghost who appears at a set of tracks near the station's entrance. In the late 1990s, a number of passengers were startled to see a semi-transparent apparition pacing by the side of a four-track section of the line at the western end of the platform 
where trains arrived from Chiswick Park. If they looked away for a split second, the figure would disappear. The apparition is said to be a stocky man in grey clothes, and some say he is wearing a heavy grey coat. But who is he, and why is he haunting? For many years, staff have affectionately known the figure as Bill, and it seems there are two recorded incidents concerning employees that could explain this ghostly presence. In 1882, a porter named William Tucker narrowly missed death at the station itself. He attempted to cross the line as a train approached from Chiswick Park. He didn't have enough time to reach the platform and within seconds, the engine was upon him and he was crushed between the train and the platform. Whilst he didn't suffer any broken bones, he did suffer from significant internal injuries and was taken to the West London Hospital. He later died. On the 10th of June 1911, a fatal accident occurred on the tracks at the approach to the station. A labourer on the district railway line named William Hume, aged 39, was working with his brother, John, an electrician, to unfasten rails for removal that night. A third employee, Silas Rawdon, was acting as a lookout for the two brothers. At quarter to four in the afternoon, Rawdon shouted that a train was coming, heading towards the city. Both brothers cleared the line and the train passed. When Rawdon looked back, he saw William Hume lying on the ground. At the inquest, another member of staff working in the area testified that he didn't see William Hume make contact with the train, but he heard him cry and watched him physically fall. He felt the deceased must have stumbled. One witness speculated that there was a spare piece of metal close by and perhaps William stood on that, found it unstable and fell and struck the train. Edward Brown, the driver, reported that he'd given the customary warning, saw the men clear the line and that he'd only heard about the accident later. There was nothing projecting from the train that would have made contact with William. Dr Russell Watson from the West London Hospital pronounced William Hume dead and that he died from haemorrhage, from rupture of the lungs and the fracture of several ribs on his right side. A verdict of accidental death was declared. Working on the railways historically and even today is a dangerous job and many people have been injured, maimed and killed as a result of their occupation. Whilst Turnham Green might seem a somewhat ordinary and unassuming station, it has a sad past that is entirely unknown by many. But I feel the stories of these two forgotten men, their deaths lost to time, deserve to be heard. Perhaps the sporadic nature of the hauntings at Turnham Green Station suggests the figure is finally at peace. The ghostly girl of Bethnal Green Underground Station was pretty new to me. I hadn't really heard of that before. I'd seen one book that included it in one of the chapters, and that's about it. But um, after I did the Ghosts of the London Underground video, which I released in March, I received an email from a lady called Linda. And she lives in Germany. And I thought her story was really interesting, whether you believe in ghosts or or not, or the unknown or communication with the dead. So I really felt her story needed to be told. So she wrote that she visited the station in 2010 on her own, and she was traveling to St. Paul's Cathedral. And she felt an immediate psychic connection. That's how she described it. An immediate psychic connection with the presence of a little girl while sat on the platform at, at uh, Bethnal Green Station. 
She couldn't physically see the apparition in front of her, but she explained that psychically she could clearly see the girl and she was barefoot and wearing a sort of pale, dirty looking dress and that the little girl said to her that her name was Evie and that she died in a fire many years ago and that she was lost and she didn't know how old she was and that the, the little girl said that she was, look, she was looking for her brother and sister and that her mother would be cross. And just after this, I suppose, psychic exchange, if that's the right expression, uh, the communication seemed to cease and the lady from Germany, Linda, she burst into tears. Um, so that was quite an interesting story, I thought. There was no mention of the little girl's appearance in terms of her eyes not being there or just having sockets, though. And then a number of weeks later, um, in fact, just after I recorded this video initially, I received another email from a viewer named Chris, whose dad, um, now retired, worked at um, Bethnal Green Station in the late 1990s. And he said that a little girl was often heard laughing in the tunnels of the central line. And occasionally the trains would be paused, which was quite a serious event and would cause quite considerable disruption. And the tunnels would have to be checked, but nobody would be found and the staff used to nickname her Edie, and the staff never had any fear of her. With this information, I looked into various archives and death records, cemetery details, etc. And sadly, it seems that so many children died as the result of fires in the 19th and 20th century in Bethnal Green. Many, many children perished this way, from working in factories and living in poor accommodation, with properties using fires to heat and cook. But there was one record um, that stood out to me, and I don't, I don't really know why, but whether this could be linked to the little girl in the tunnel, I don't know. And so I'm going to read this little article out to you now. At Bethnal Green on Monday, an inquest was held on Caroline Eva Foster, aged four years, daughter of a boot finisher, residing in Whiston Street, Shoreditch. On December the 17th, the child was with a boy aged eight in the wash house. The boy was feeding the copper fire and as the little girl turned to give him some sweets, her muslin pinafore caught fire. She was removed to the Queen's Hospital where death took place last Friday. It was stated that the child's clothes consisted entirely of flannelette with the exception of the pinafore. So I've been searching for the death certificate for little Caroline and looking for her burial records, but I can't find anything much so far. So at this point, I don't know where she was buried, uh, but I'll keep looking. Whether this could be linked at all to the little girl on the underground, I don't know. But I just really want to thank Linda and Chris for their emails. I thought they were really interesting. So thank you very much and I'll see you next time.